Today we're going to turn to a third application of capitalist markets in the Michael Sandel text. And this is an application of markets to areas of life where perhaps a lot of us would say something is lost when market-based efficiency gains are realized. And I'm referring here to chapter 3. Okay, and let's go ahead and start in on this. Are there some things that money simply cannot buy? No matter how much is offered, no matter how well the system is set up, are there some things that money simply cannot buy? Sandel certainly thinks so. An example might be friendship. You can offer somebody money to spend time with you and to pretend to be your friend. I mean, heck, we have services now where bots can basically buy friends on Facebook to promote particular social media accounts. But genuine friendship is, by definition, something that arises out of free will and sincerity. And that's not something that can be bought. Another example that Sandel cites of something that can't be bought is awards, like an Academy Award or an MVP trophy uh, from baseball or a championship trophy from football or basketball. These things, of course, can be bought in one sense. The statuette that people get if they win an Oscar can be bought. But the fact of the award itself is not something that actually can be brought into the calculus of markets. The award itself is something that is beyond price since it is an indication or a representation of the assessment of one's peers and not actually something that markets are capable of, of understanding and bringing into the calculus of, of monetary transactions. There are other things, though, that perhaps money can't buy, but certainly people are trying to uh, make money buy it. On page 96, for instance, Sandel talks about a couple examples. One is this crazy example of bought apologies. It's real hard for some people to apologize to each other. And so in 2001, the New York Times published a story about a company in China that offers an unusual service. If you need to apologize to someone, an estranged lover or business partner with whom you've had a falling out, and you can't quite bring yourself to do so in person, you can hire the Tianjin Apology Company to apologize on your behalf. Okay, a wild, a wild development in capitalist history, but certainly something that uh, makes sense from a, a, a monetary transaction perspective. A lot of people don't know what to say in situations like that, so they uh, choose the capitalist way out and hire someone else to say it for them. As I was reading that, I was actually thinking of the greeting card industry. So the greeting card industry probably exists because people aren't quite sure how to say things to each other, to their friends and loved ones. So they try to find a greeting card that captures what their sentiments are. Here's another example, though. Um, wedding toasts. Okay, he writes, consider another social practice closely connected to friendship, a wedding toast to the bride and groom. Traditionally, such toasts are warm, funny, heartfelt expressions of good wishes, but it's not easy to compose an elegant wedding speech, and many uh, don't feel up to the task. So some have resorted to buying wedding toasts online. You can now actually fill out a questionnaire online, and within three business days, you receive a professionally written custom toast of three to five minutes, price $149 payable by credit card. Um, Fascinating, fascinating as a use of capitalist markets. Okay, but arguably, when you do try to bring these interpersonal and relationally close human phenomena, like apologies and wedding toasts, into the orbit of capitalist markets, something gets displaced. Okay, and that's what Sandel is primarily interested in in this third chapter. Um, capitalist markets tend to displace other values whenever they enter the scene. And this is because capitalist markets are so powerful. The forces in capitalist markets 
tend to dominate all other kinds of values. What do I mean by this? Well, I think that the primary example in the chapter, uh, beginning on page 98, is a good illustration of this. We are some months away from Christmas. It's about seven months, actually. My grandmother, when I was growing up, always used to purchase everyone's Christmas gifts in the summer and then have them get them for cheap, basically, and have them all ready. But seven months from now, when Christmas does roll around, let me give you guys a choice. Option one, from your parents, let's say, you can receive a heartfelt, warm, loving gift selected by them for you. Option two, you can receive the same amount of money that they would have spent on that heartfelt gift in the form of cash from your parents, which will give you the opportunity to choose the gift you please. Let's have a quick show of hands. Who would prefer the heartfelt gift selected by your parents? Three of us. Who would prefer the cash? Two of us. If we had a larger room, I suspect it would about be about 50-50. Those of you who just asserted that you'd rather have the heartfelt gift by your, from your parents, why is that the case? I saw three hands go up. Somebody articulate what the decisive factor there was for you. For one, I'm pretty sure my parents know me well enough to tell me something that I, I like. Okay, you. Okay, that's a great comment. Mm -hmm. The gift that they like, they like put effort in it, and they thought about what you would like, so they're like your main contact. Sure, sure, sure. So I think that's great. Your York highlighted two things that he likes about it. One is he thinks his parents know him well enough to be able to get him something that he'd appreciate. And the second is that the fact of the search by his parents for a heartfelt gift, it indicates, it signals their love for him, their desire to do something for him, their desire to go out of their way, as it were, to do something beyond normal for his sake. And he appreciates that. That's an important part of gift giving for him. I suspect that for Tatiana and Brinkley, that was decisive as well. Is that correct? Okay. Um, those of us who chose cash, Chloe, I think you chose cash and Joaquin as well. Um, what are the advantages of cash, in your opinion, over this uh, heartfelt uh, gift that your parents have, have looked for for you? That's great, man. You can use cash for whatever you want. No one knows you better than you know yourself. That's actually the key to capitalist markets. No one knows you better than you know yourself. And Joaquin says, you can use cash for whatever you want. Look, guys, I've received a lot of gifts over the years for Christmas and on other occasions. And a whole bunch of these gifts never or rarely get used. So January comes around and you intend to use the gift, but you don't really see space for it in your life. You leave it in the closet because you don't want to actually, you know, go through the shame of telling the gift giver that you returned it. Some of us just return it. Um, okay. Uh, most of us just, we just waste it. It's, it's just not something that's valuable to us. And a lot of gifts end up being unused because it's inefficient. It's less efficient for others to give gifts to us than for us to give gifts to ourselves. Capitalist markets are successful precisely because they individualize people and they individualize companies. Let me describe what I mean by that. In a capitalist market, each individual is pitted against all the rest. Each company is pitted against all the rest. In a competitive enterprise for scarce goods, in the case of the demand side, or for scarce customers, in the case of the supply side. And in capitalist markets, you are taught by the structural forces in the market to think of your own interests, to look out for your own interests, and to improve your own lot. And the idea, at least in theory, as originally articulated by a founding theorists of capitalism like Adam Smith and David Ricardo, 
was that by pursuing our own interests, we actually bring about a better system as a whole. Adam Smith used a famous example of the butcher who cuts his meat. He says, the butcher does not give me a successful meat cutting experience out of the goodness of his heart. Rather, he gives me a successful meat cutting experience precisely because he wants to make money because of his desire to improve his own lot, because of his self-interest. Capitalist markets then structure our thinking to think of ourselves individualistically. America is perhaps the most individualistic country the world has ever seen. All the technologies move in that direction, the individualized smartphone, the individualized laptop. Well, actually, this was, we were set on this path by capitalist markets. And capitalist markets tend to structure our thought and our motivations so that we think individualistically. And they do really, really well in enterprises that uh, do well when people think as individuals. But capitalist markets perhaps don't do so well in enterprises that require people to think collectively or that, um, that tap into social connection or relational, emotional connection. Half of us said we'd prefer a heartfelt gift, even in spite of the inefficiency of a heartfelt gift. Because the heartfelt gift conveys something that the capitalist market can't capture. Yes, it's less efficient, but they went to the extra effort for me to find the gift. And that signals something of value that's beyond price. Okay, some people these days are um, just giving cash, but some people are trying to split the difference and give the gift card. <laughs> it's a common trend these days. I've gotten a lot of them recently uh, for gifts for Christmas. The gift card is kind of flaky, I think, as a, a phenomenon. I don't want to ruin it the next time you get a gift card. But it's basically saying, look, here's cash with restrictions on it. <laughs> so you don't get the efficiency gains, since you can only use it in this particular store. But maybe it signals a little bit of love, because I did go to the effort to obtain the gift card for you. <laughs> I was trying to split the difference. Um, at any rate, though, Sandel's point in referencing this example is that actually um, what happens is that markets displace other kinds of values when they encounter things like gift giving and other phenomena. Okay, when cash is given, it displaces to some extent the value of love, care, and concern that the gift signals when it is a gift that someone has selected for you, has, has chosen. Uh, it's as if these values are incompatible and can't be there simultaneously. Cash to some feels cold, it feels hard, it feels unloving because the person didn't go to the effort to find something for you. For others, the efficiency gains that come with cash, the ability to do what you want with the money, outweigh other kinds of values and are more important. Okay, Sandel does cite a few other examples here. Uh, looking on page 109, I want to highlight that one. Okay, so the college admissions process is what he's talking about there. All of us now have gone through this process. It's a very opaque process. That is, it's full of twists and turns and dark alleys. Some people get into highly desirable schools and others don't. And the reasons why are all very complex. Sometimes people get in because of athletic prowess. Sometimes they get in because they are legacy students. That is, their parents went to an institution, so they get an easier time getting into that institution. Sometimes people get in on merit. Sometimes they get in because of ethnic characteristics or gender quotas. What about using markets to resolve this social coordination problem? Here are scarce goods, college admission slots at desirable universities. So let's just give these slots to the people who are willing and able to pay. 
In other words, use a market-based solution to resolve this phenomenon. <clears throat> What would be the advantages of doing that? From the perspective of the student wanting to get into the university, what's an advantage? Parents have money. Yeah. If your parents have money, that opens the door to you to get into whatever elite school you want to get into. From the perspective of the universities, is this advantageous as well? Yeah. Well, for sure. If you have slots to sell and these are in great demand, you can charge high prices for them. Is this mutually advantageous for everyone involved in the process? No, not at all, right? Because, of course, it discriminates against those who have merits but not means. It discriminates against those who maybe have skills but can't pay. It's not something that everybody would appreciate. Okay, uh, on page 109 toward the bottom of the page, uh, we get into some of the objections to the values that get displaced by the market-based solution in a college admission situation. College admission is a good that can be bought and sold provided the buying and selling takes place discreetly. By the way, actually, uh, college admissions is regularly bought and sold, uh, but it happens behind closed doors. It happens in the form of donations to universities. These donations secure spots for the people whose parents and wealthy benefactors donate on their behalf. Whether colleges and universities should do so is a further question. The idea of selling admission is open to two objections. One is about fairness and the other is about corruption. The fairness objection says that admitting children of wealthy donors in exchange for a handsome donation to the college fund is unfair to applicants who lacked the good judgment to be born to affluent parents. Okay, this objection views a college education as a source of opportunity and access and worries that giving an edge to children of the wealthy perpetuates social and economic inequality. That's an objection that we've looked at before in other contexts. The idea there is just that capitalist markets discriminate unfairly against those who don't have means. One objection, though, that we have looked at less frequently is the corruption objection. The corruption objection, this is on page 110, is about institutional integrity. This objection points out that higher education not only equips students for remunerative jobs, it also embodies certain ideals. The pursuit of truth, the promotion of scholarly and scientific excellence, etc., etc. Although all universities need money to pursue their ends, uh, allowing fundraising needs to predominate runs the risk of distorting these ends and corrupting the norms that give universities their reason for being. Okay, so uh, a very frequent objection to the application of capitalist markets in scenarios or social coordination uh, locations that are not traditionally market-based is that doing so ends up corrupting the good in question. And in this case, the university experience, which traditionally a lot of thought should go beyond just preparation for a profession, just the... the um, the monetary side of things and should include things like the cultivation of civic virtue or the uh, development of one's well-roundedness as a human being. These kinds of values would get displaced, of course, by the presence of the market-based forces, which tend to take all whenever they come into contact with other kinds of, um, other kinds of values. Okay, I want to highlight one final set of concerns and interests in the chapter. And that is um, when capitalist markets backfire and don't actually improve efficiency. This does sometimes happen. And it happens in a very narrow set of circumstances. Uh, the great, great majority of the time, let, let, me, let me stress this just so there's no confusion about this. The great majority of the time, <clears throat> capitalist markets dramatically improve efficiency because they place in the hands of individuals the ability to determine their own future, their own fate, their own choices. But capitalist markets sometimes actually reduce efficiency. 
And the narrow set of circumstances in which they do sometimes reduce efficiency uh, primarily includes circumstances where people are motivated by a sense of civic duty or by some sort of a common allegiance that goes beyond uh, just their own individual welfare. I'm thinking especially about this case that Sandel cites on page 114, uh, this nuclear waste sites case. So let me just read uh, the example in his own words. For years, Switzerland, the country of Switzerland, of course, in Europe, had been trying to find a place to store radioactive nuclear waste. Although the country relies heavily on nuclear energy, few communities wanted nuclear waste to reside in their midst. So they've got a, a coordination problem. The problem is where to store the toxic uh, waste products of their, uh, of their nuclear facilities. One location designated as a potential nuclear waste site was the small mountain village of Wolfenschiessen in central Switzerland. In 1993, shortly before a referendum on the issue, some economists surveyed the residents of the village asking whether they would vote to accept a nuclear waste repository in their community. So this is a survey of whether the residents would be willing to accept the nuclear waste site in their vicinity. Although the facility was widely viewed as an undesirable addition to the neighborhood, a slim majority, about 51% of the residents of the town of Wolfenschiessen, said they would accept it. Apparently, their sense of civic duty outweighed their concern about the risks. But then the economists changed the question. They also surveyed using the following question, suppose Parliament proposed building the nuclear waste facility in your community and it offered to compensate each resident with an annual monetary payment. Then would you favor building the waste facility in your vicinity? So the initial question in the survey is, would you allow the facility, would you favor allowing the facility to be built in the vicinity of your village without monetary payment? And now monetary payment has been added. Whereas previously 51% said they would accept the facility, the result when monetary payment was added was that support went down, not up. Adding the financial inducement actually cut the rate of acceptance in half from 51 to 25%. So whereas previously 51% were willing to accept it, now just 25% are willing to accept it. Can someone articulate for us precisely why? 26% of the surveyed people changed their views and now became unwilling to support the nuclear waste facility, Brinkley? They said they thought, well, if they're trying to pay it, then obviously it's going to be like a renewable energy or something. Yeah, I totally think that that's part of it. Uh, generally speaking, if a deal is made even better by somebody, when really they didn't have to because you know enough people already were willing to take the deal, it does suggest ulterior motives and something isn't being disclosed properly. I definitely think that's part of the case. The part that Sandel focuses in on, although I think Brinkley's right, is that uh, people primarily were motivated by civic duty prior to the monetary payment. But when the monetary payment came into the equation, it became evident to them that this was a market-based transaction and not a civic duty governed circumstance. And as such, Sandel says, their, um, their support went down. He later writes, the residents stood firm even when offered yearly cash payments as high as $8,700 per person, well in excess of the median monthly income. Market forces tend to displace other values, and in this case, a sense, a sense of civic responsibility, obligation, or duty appears to be what was displaced. Um, and so sometimes, actually, markets undermine efficiency. It happens rarely, but it does happen in circumstances where people tend to be governed by a strong sense of collective fellow feeling. These days, in our individualistic times, there aren't many such circumstances, but they do, do still exist. They're just not real frequent. And maybe this nuclear waste site example was one such example. There's another example that Sandel highlights later on in the chapter about the same phenomenon. 
And this has to do with blood donation. Okay, um, let me just read his uh, words starting on page 122. Perhaps the best known illustration of markets crowding out non-market norms is a classic study of blood donation. Um, the, the theorist doing the study compared the system of blood collection used in the United Kingdom, that is the British Isles, where all blood for transfusion is given by unpaid voluntary donors. They compared it with the system in the United States where some blood is donated and some bought by commercial blood banks from people, typically the poor who are willing to sell their blood as a way of making money. So here we have two systems, one that's entirely donation-based and one that's partly donation-based and partly uh, market-based, based on what people are willing to pay. Which system do you think actually uh, has better success in terms of efficiency gains and actually bringing about people's donations, or, or I'm sorry, not donations, but people supplying their blood. Okay, it's, Sandel does uh, reference this implicitly, but it's actually primarily the, um, the UK system. The more that it's just pure donation, the more efficient the system tends to operate. Probably because in this case, Again, people are motivated by a sense of civic duty or obligation as opposed to just a sense of cash transaction where they are primarily doing it for their own sake and see themselves as individuals over and against everyone else. Okay, so those are a couple of examples of ways in which markets displace other motives but do not actually provide us with efficiency gains when they do so. Uh, let me pause and see if there are any questions or comments about Chapter 3. I had hoped to get to Chapter 4 today, and I'm actually going to say a couple real quick things about Chapter 4, but then I'm going to let you guys go five minutes early, so uh, I won't spend too much time on it. Okay, um, the Chapter 4 investigation is a look at uh, ways in which Markets and market-based forces have been applied to issues of life and death, which might initially seem kind of crass to us, but actually it's something that is all the time uh, a realistic uh, thing. For instance, uh, these days, because of market forces, a whole bunch of people are choosing to be cremated when they die rather than to be buried because burial is expensive. And so, just for market-based reasons, they decide they want to be ashes instead of uh, be buried in a, in a casket, a coffin. Sandel, though, uh, covers this interesting phenomenon uh, called janitor's insurance. Okay, uni uh, not universities, companies, uh, generally speaking, for a long time have taken out insurance policies on the lives of their CEOs and top executives to offset the cost of replacing them if and when they die. Some workers at companies are highly valuable, the skilled workers especially, but also leadership positions. And insurance policies to ensure that that value is retained have been a common feature for a long period of time. But recently, actually, a large number of companies have begun taking out insurance policies on others including on a bunch of lower level employees. Okay, so here's this case at the beginning of the chapter. Michael Rice, 48, an assistant manager at a Walmart in New Hampshire, was helping a customer carry a television to her car when he had a heart attack and collapsed. He died a week later. An insurance policy on his life paid out about $300,000, but the money did not go to his wife and two children. It went to Walmart which had purchased the policy on his life and named itself as the beneficiary. Okay, um, this is a really interesting study, and I'll just say a couple real quick things about it, but I'm not going to be able to get into the rest of the chapter on this. But it's a really interesting study precisely because markets are so powerful that they can displace other normal kinds of motives. Think about life insurance just as a phenomenon. Um, who is life insurance intended to be for? 
We're all familiar with life insurance, yes? Who is it intended to be for? Is it the, for the person who's dying? No, right? Who is it for then? For the loved ones, the spouse and the dependents, so that they might be cared for in the absence of the breadwinner or whatever in the family. But markets have a way of actually changing motives and changing structures, and they can displace other kinds of values. They are so powerful. In this case, actually, the, <laughs> these companies appear to be gambling that they know better than uh, their employees and maybe the companies that they're taking out the insurance policies from on when their employees are going to die. And as such, they think they can make money by doing this. So we have insurance that's not for the sake of the protection and care of the loved ones, but actually that is for the sake of profit. Now, this strikes a lot of us probably as being kind of icky, not the sort of thing that one should devote one's insurance policies toward. But capitalist markets don't, they don't mess around with icky factors. It's not something that they really care about all that much. Capitalist markets are good at connecting up buyers and sellers and making things efficient. And whether or not you like what is being bought and sold, whether a life insurance policy or some other good in question, it's not something that the market really cares about. It simply connects you up to someone else who's willing to be on the other side of the transaction. Okay, there's a lot more that could, of course, be said about that in this chapter, but I'm going to stop here. Um, let me say just a couple real quick summary things, and then I'll let you guys go. Uh, this has been a fast-paced course where we have covered a variety of different topics in business ethics. We started off with big picture questions, talking about uh, what the purpose of business was, for, so that's for the company itself, and also about what your individual purpose in business should be, what you should be aiming at as a participant in business. We then went on to talk about uh, the connection between Christianity and business, and I argued that although capitalism is not a Christian system by any means, nevertheless, Christians can participate conscientiously in the system and be successful within it. The key, since the system incentivizes looking after your own interests, the key is to look not only after your own interests, but also after the interests of your customers at the same time, so that there are mutual advantages that can be obtained by means of your transactions with them. We then went on to look in rapid pace at a bunch of different sub-modules in the different areas of business, management ethics and issues having to do with supply chain management. We looked at finance ethics. We looked at accounting ethics, issues having to do with, um, with uh, proper financial reporting. Uh, we looked at marketing ethics and disclosure issues, truth in advertising issues, et cetera. We then finished the semester with a couple of special purpose investigations. One was the interface of business and the environment. And then another was uh, this real quick look at the end of the semester. I wish we'd had a little bit more time to get into the rest of this text. But this overview of the moral strengths and weaknesses of capitalist markets. Okay, I've had a great semester with you guys. It's been a very different semester than anything else that I have had in the course of my teaching career, but I appreciate the perseverance of you guys um, as you have come to class. Um, it's been fun to learn alongside you this semester, so thank you for that. Let me say a real quick prayer for us, and I'll let you guys go. Please pray with me. Gracious God, I want to thank you for these students. I thank you for the blessing that they've been to me and the inspiration that they've been in persevering in their studies in the course of this difficult and challenging pandemic year. I pray for uh, your grace, your strength, and your wisdom for them over the next week and a half or two weeks as they complete their assignments, their papers, their projects, their tests. Pray that you would give them discipline and insight as they seek to finish this semester strong. And then I pray that you would give them rest so that they can recover from the, the grueling academic year uh, over the summer. Thank you for bringing us this far in the school year. We pray for your grace, your mercy to uh, make it just a little bit farther and to do so uh, as successfully as possible. We pray these things in your name. Amen.
Thanks, friends. Go in peace. If you have any questions about the final or anything else class-related, uh, see me after class or shoot me an email. That's the quickest way to contact me. Okay? Take care. Good to see you all today.